This is Critical Nonsense, our high lowbrow show about culture, science, and tech. This week, Cutie Corner, special guests Ash Casper and Nora Mestrich join me to talk about hobbies. Today, for part one, Nora asks us about the revival of real hobbies hobbies. Woo! We have like a cutie intro song, Alex, for Cutie Corner. Doom, cha, doom, doom, cha. Beauty Corner. Hi, this is Jess, and I'm here today for another special episode of your favorite Cutie Corner. With me, I have special guest, Cutie in Chief, and also designer, Nora Mestrich. Welcome to the show. Hey! And I also have Officer of Cute and also designer but not for the show, Ash Casper, special guest. Welcome back to the show. So happy to be here. (laughs) Uh, So happy to have you. And I am very excited that we are actually going to be kicking off two weeks of a special limited Cutie Corner series. Nora, can you tell us about the theme for these weeks of Cutie Corner? Yes. The theme that we're going to be talking about is hobbies. So what are our hobbies? Why are they our hobbies? The culture around hobbies, the culture around side hustles versus hobbies, all those good things. We're going to dive deep into post-work activities. Yes. And it's interesting too, because the first time I think that we talked about hobbies on the show, Joey, Aaron, and I had a conversation back in the spring of 2019 when we were realizing that hobbies were feeling so much like hustles for some reason. And I am really excited to have Nora chat with us revisiting several years later this question of hobbies in our first part of a two-part hobbies series. Nora, do you want to kick us off? Yes, I'd love to. Um, The topic we're going to start with was inspired because in my time being online, particularly recently, I've seen, and through conversations with friends, Ash in particular, uh, I've seen this rise in people returning to, I would guess I would call them analog hobbies. So things like reading, knitting, baking, things that you would do with your hands that don't require a screen. And it just got me thinking about how hobbies have returned and how they've been less related to the culture of side hustles that I think we saw a few years prior um, before the pandemic. And so it just got me wondering, uh, why did hobbies become hobbies again? So interesting that such a question need be posed. I feel like I'm immediately craving some of the evidence. Like, how do we know that hobbies are now hobbying themselves? I think the one... The, the the hobby that I saw, like, that inspired this train of thought is reading. I have always been an avid reader. I don't know about you guys, but I was, like, a big public library kid and, like, always mm-hmm. participated in the, like, summer reading challenges where you would, like, get prizes for books that you read. Yeah. Um, but reading was always, like, a, a big hobby of mine as a kid, especially as someone who wasn't allowed, like, screen time or TV very often. And I've carried that with me into adulthood. I'm still a big public library fan. I read very frequently. My recording device is currently propped up on a very large stack of library books. Um, it's I really enjoy doing it to get off of screens in the evening or on the weekends. Mm-hmm. And in my time on screens in the evenings and the weekends, I've seen it's very interesting. Reading has become very trendy. And there is this huge spike that I've noticed. Like, wait, in, what does that even mean, Nora? It's like, it's I I it's like I women in particular, like young women in their 20s, there's been this like huge trend in like sharing what you're reading and doing mm. book hauls online and then mm. doing book reviews and like influencers recommending to their audiences books that they've enjoyed or have read and you know people just like going online buying ebooks i think using their kindles going to the library i've seen a huge push online of 
people visiting the library and encouraging others to sign up for library cards. Um, side note, the Brooklyn Public Library has like an incredible Instagram presence, which I think is amazing. They like mm. use memes and things to talk about <laughs> programming that they have at their library and like encouraging mm. people to sign up for library cards. But mm. I've seen this huge spike in people recommending books to read or reviewing books. And I think you can really see this start to come through in books that have been popular on what's colloquially called book talk, which is mm. influencers book influencers on book TikTok who recommend like TikTok. Yes. Yes. Like Got TikTok, it. but with book. Uh, yeah. And it's book influencers recommending novels to their audiences. And what's really interesting is that you're seeing this start to influence like literature in the world. So I pulled up the New York Times bestseller list for fiction. And there's an author who's very, very popular on TikTok. And just in general with like a, like young 20s like early 20s audience named colleen hoover and she currently has uh i think five or six out of the top 15 books on the bestsellers list and everything else on the fiction bestsellers list right now is i think with the exception of one is a book that i have seen recommended time and time and time again on tiktok and so it's just very interesting to start to see that influence like manifest in the world and this summer, when I was traveling quite a bit, I went to a bunch of different bookstores kind of up and down the East Coast. Every single bookstore I went into had a display right at the front of the store that said recommendations from Book Talk on it of like mm. these books that are very popular that people are like really desiring to read. So interesting. It makes me think a little bit about, I was reading an Atlantic, Atlantic article that was talking a little bit about how hobbies have kind of infiltrated and what the word hobby really meant uh, a long time ago. And there's this idea of like productive leisure versus the true essence of leisure. And it makes me think a little bit about like what types of books are, are people reading? Are they pure entertainment? Is it educational? And like, you know, in the, in the, in the broader spectrum relating to hobbies, I've noticed in myself there, when I first started making things, there was this pressure for things to be perfect and have something at the end of it instead of the hobby being the journey, it being like the act of making something and it didn't really matter what was at the end. So I, I wonder if we could maybe dive into this idea of like productive leisure as it relates to hobbies or just hobbies for the joy of creating or the joy of reading or just the joy of it, which is true. I think actually what the word hobby means, but there's been this like reinterpretation and this evolution. We always have to be productive. We always have to have a thing at the end to prove yeah. that we, that we you know made something or we engaged in this hobby. Well, that's actually, I, I almost want to even split one, one other fork in that where like there's this element of, is it for like, what is the thing that is driving you to this hobby? Is it that you are doing it for yourself or is it doing, mm -hmm. are you doing it to accomplish something like in service of another thing? And I think forking off of that is maybe this idea of like hobbies that were private are becoming more public and maybe other hobbies that were public maybe used to be correlated with productive hobbies. Like, look at me accomplishing this thing. Like, that looks like a hustle and social media is a forum where I can generate business off of this thing that I'm doing for fun, but also now for work. And I wonder if there were certain elements to the pandemic where, you know, everyone's reading and uh, baking bread and doing stuff at home and no one's there to see it. Like if a, if a bread was baked in an oven in a house and no one was around to watch it be baked, like, did it even happen? Did, did you even bake this bread? And so I wonder if part of the thing that we're seeing is related to publicizing these private hobbies that otherwise people wouldn't be getting credit for in a way like it wouldn't be getting social currency for, as horrible maybe as it feels to utter this out loud like not getting social currency for all of the reading that you've been doing in this downtime so like I better show that I'm being busy and I'm I am being quote-unquote productive in my leisure by posting about it by participating in book talk is this a cynic talking or like I don't know what do you think 
I mean, I think that's part of it, right? Like, I think part of this, like, trend, this, like, trend of reading that I've noticed, too, is people posting their, like, Goodreads goals and then, yes. like, getting competitive with themselves about, like, I saw a TikTok the other day that a girl was like, these next two months are crucial for our Goodreads goals. Like, we've got to, like, buckle down and really get reading so we can hit our goals, you know? And it's like, that's so interesting. Like, the only person you're competing with is yourself, Mm -hmm. In that case, and you're competing with something that is like a leisurely activity, which is just opening a book and reading it at any pace that you desire, whether that is quickly or slowly. It maybe also is coming with like reading in particular, maybe coming at a time where culturally like intellectualism is in or at least like science is in and looking smart is in because if you're not doing those things, then like maybe you're one of the, the sheeple. So like, it's actually kind of an interesting idea too, of people seeking out certain hobbies that feel like a worthwhile way to spend time. Whereas before, um, you know, maybe there were different qualifications for what was like a worthy leisure hobby. I, I want I have no nothing to back this up also. I only my own personal experience. <laughs> we love conjecture here. <laughs> I, I like reading, but I, I do wonder also if like people are just you know, over the pandemic I'm sure people consumed content at a level that was kind of unprecedented. Like, you know, binge watching a series or just like constantly yeah. scrolling through a TikTok and that of course it affects your attention span. And I wonder if there's a shift also in one, people wanting to try out a different medium, but also mm -hmm. just consume content in a way that can fill time in a way that like binge watching a series doesn't doesn't do. And two, like maybe you're running out of content, you know, like maybe you've like worked your way through all of the interesting things that are out there and like Netflix, HBO, whatever, can't keep up with, can't keep up with how quickly people consume Your content. Content books hunter. might be, yeah, exactly. And books are just this super, super fertile space of like really, really amazing content that just maybe has been neglected for a long time. Well, you, that makes me think of an interesting point too, which is like remaining connected through an analog activity where it's like, okay, well, if, if everybody is reading the same book, the the one that it's like, or the same author that has five or six books in the New York Times bestseller list, like we're not all like sitting down and reading the book together in one room, but we're all reading the book independently and then going online to have conversations about it. Or like you see that somebody else is reading that book on the subway and you like feel a connection to that person because you've read that book and loved that book or, or, or you hated that book and you connect with the people that also had a feeling to that. Right. Like it's, it's almost like, it's almost like a, a global book club that we can all participate in. Yeah. The, yeah. that idea of, of like hobbying now as a form of participation and as tethered to, to TikTok, which is in so many ways, like, you know, sy symbolic of like, what it means to like create something participatory is such a, it, it is really interesting because with the overabundance of content and stuff to do, I mean, the internet is a perfect example of like, so like there are so many different pockets that it is actually quite difficult to find things that are more universal. Uh, and so being able to read the book, that you can be sure that your friends in college or wherever are also reading for fun. Like that is something that maybe is more unifying. It's that, that is certainly a more optimistic take. <laughs> yeah. Like be Michelle Obama's becoming was like as, as big a hype as like yes. stranger things, you know, like it was a big deal and it is cool to finally see maybe things leveling out a little bit, honestly, in terms of medium, because one, I we're just, we're all on screens too much. Yeah. And there's just other forms of communication that should, that should be, you know, heroed in a, in a better way. This is also what I think is like so funny about like the generational terror that comes every, every generation goes through this thing where they look and they're like, oh no, the youth is deteriorating <laughs> and like they have lost the all sense of grounding and like respect for things that were once great. Like what about the pure joys of reading a simple book? <laughs> now you're like, oh, actually they came, they came to the senses. And <laughs> they still never read. Mind. They actually, still read. actually yeah. they read, they read like maybe more than I read. And <laughs> mm. I just think it's really funny The you know, um, like so sometimes it's just like the, 
the patience or the need to to have faith in like the cultural tides of I don't know what it what it means to like entertain ourselves but also push ourselves and I don't know I, it's it is hopeful I like this I like this way of thinking about it much more Nora <laughs> yeah and yeah. Ash yeah <laughs> Um, any other words we have about this swing back to hobbies, hobbying? I think I the think, only, oh, oh, mm, <laughs> no, I think I the, I think the, I don't want to open an entire can of worms with this, but I do also find it very interesting that this is happening in tandem with the time that we're seeing people like really respond strongly to burnout and this idea that I don't know if you guys have seen this term floating around of quiet quitting of people just Mm -hmm. kind of like like throwing in the towel a little bit and phoning it in because things are just so intense and the idea of work being the thing that rules your life is like not important to people and there is something interesting about like hobbies returning at the same time that like quiet quitting or the response to burnout is like hitting a peak also that I think is really interesting of like people are really choosing to like time box their job into the like the eight hours or whatever a day that they're there and just there's a desire to fill the rest of their time with things that don't relate to that at all and can give you maybe just like a little bit of peace of mind it's it's why I love, I just, I mean, I'm, I'm knitting as we talk here, but I, I love, I just love making things because it gives me a, a sense of connection that's like outside of myself. It's outside of work. And, and I, you know, I'm new to New York. I just moved here. And so uh, on my commutes, I've been knitting and actually there's sometimes other people knitting and there's this like, there's this like, oh yeah, you know, I know, Got you. you know, we're just, yeah. you know, we're just trying <laughs> we're just to knitters dis- here. We're just knitters here, but we're just trying to disconnect. <laughs> and there, I do think that there's something really nice about like connecting with your hands and connecting with something really tactile. And I think TikTok and social media does like create more entry points for people to see different types of hobbies that might be of interest and like even learn how to do things. Like I just go on YouTube if I want to learn a new stitch YouTube, and it makes man. it super easy yep. to like utilize technology to be able to learn something and then feel confident enough to like try things out and be iterative. And so I do think that like, you know, screens aren't always bad, right? Like there's something really nice about like being able to, if you have a question or if you want to learn to make something, you can just kind of dive in at different altitudes and, and mm-hmm. it makes it really accessible. Um, and there's, you know, hot, you know, baking or there's, th- there's all different levels of ways in which you can just kind of get your hands dirty. And it's less about, again, the, what happens at the end and more about just like trying things and, and learning things. Um, there's. Uh, I also, um, there, when I lived in Richmond, there was a pottery studio that I would, that I would throw at. And there was a woman who would come and never kept anything she made. She only threw on the wheel for the experience of throwing on the wheel. So she would come and she would throw her clay down and she would make, and at the end she would smush it all and then just put it back in a bag. And then she would come back the next day and do the same thing. Cause she didn't care about like the end result, she just loved the experience of throwing wow. so much. And that was like, it was like yoga, it was like meditative to her. So I do think there, there's just the whole world of ways in which people can interact with making or hobbies that not focusing on the end result is, is, a, is kind of a good way to, to approach it. I love that. That is so yeah. awesome. She was really cool. <laughs> <laughs> she was really cool. And she, she wasn't was even cool. trying to do anything. Yeah. She didn't even yeah. care. <laughs> <laughs> we admire her so much for that. You know, I I think that, you know, Ash, you're touching on the things that hobbies can bring, like the reason why they are so satisfactory for their own sake, right? And and I think, Nora, you're touching on with, I love how there's a word for this, like quiet quitting used to just be like, <laughs> that's what jobs were for many, for a long time, like a nine to five was that for a reason and uh, there has just been a recent period where I think people are more interested in um, having more purposeful work right I think we you know our, our company has written a bunch of things about that but um, I think you know if Ash is speaking to the side of what makes these hobbies for leisure so enjoyable Nora you're also addressing why like also people are running away from the other stuff that isn't as enjoyable uh, and no surprise that people are looking for things that are nourishing and uh, engaging and 
potentially even challenging with our limited attention spans and like, you know, forcing yourself to do um, things that push you out of your comfort zone, even if YouTube is a very great teacher and can give you a, a push and lower the barriers to entry. It's, uh, it is a, it is an interesting time and maybe a really great time to get into a hobby. And I think this is probably wrapping it up. Do you agree? Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Everybody go make something. Yeah. Go get a library card. Yeah. Or the New York City e-library, if you happen to be based in New York, check out also your local library if they have an e-library of some kind. It is amazing if you're into that and shout out to the brooklyn public library which is now offering library cards to teenagers all across the united states to access their digital library oh you're like the library spokesperson i love i really am i really am (laughs) oh my goodness if if anyone from the new york public library system is interested in coming on critical nonsense (laughs) you have a seat at this table just letting you know now thank you very much we hope we get to speak with you soon Critical Nonsense is a Sylvain production brought to you by that very helpful YouTube video. We'd like to thank special guest and potter Ash Casper, special guest and kitten foster Nora Mestridge, sound engineer and photo booth operator Alex Contell, programming coordinator and ice cream reviewer Les Jacobs, production crew and seamstress Sari Gilbert, and as always, thanks a lot, who also makes epic Halloween costumes. Special thanks. Special thanks to Starbucks, who recently relaunched the fall menu. So, fun. Special thanks to the woman who lives on the fifth floor, who made my day today by telling me I looked like an Olympian, (laughs) and that I was very smart. (laughs) Oh, wow. My God. Special thanks to her. Truly very special thanks. Um, special thanks to the worker at the Everlane store who gave me a pair of free boots that I didn't order, but they accidentally packed them with the things I did order. So thank you. They're really nice and they fit. Special thanks to Mother Earth for giving us some rain this week. Much needed here in New York. Everything was looking thirsty. Um... Special thanks to, I don't, nope, I don't have one. (laughs) I don't know. I ran (laughs) out of special thanks. Okay, thanks, bye. (laughs) No more thank yous. I'm out of thank yous. (laughs) I'm out of credit. Do we have like a cutie intro song, Alex? We can make it. Shoo up, shoo up. (laughs) (laughs) 